Hello, JSConf. I'm Tiger, and I'm really excited to be here. And I'm honored to be your last speaker before lunch. I saw some people already feel like it's lunchtime as is. To get things started, let's do some quick Q&A. Raise your hand if you have a phone. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm glad we all have something in common. But raise your hand if you still have an old phone that you didn't throw out. I'm not judging. I mean, look at me. <laughs> As you can see in the title, I'm going to talk about my pet project, building interactive wall decor from junk phones. This won't be a very conventional tech talk beyond JavaScript and IoT. We'll also be doing some arts and crafts and then some woodworking classes. Really, you're going to get free talks for the price of one. <laughs> a little about myself. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, working on a new web collaboration platform called Loop. I'm a WPC participant, and I previously worked on a couple different browsers like Edge, Chrome, Firefox for Android. I went to university in Canada, and I now live in Seattle. I flew here all the way from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I was also born and raised in Hawaii, and... <laughs> oh my god, two claps in such short succession. Right. Well. You know how every family has a designated computer person? That was me growing up. Yeah, I can see some nodding out there, too. While doing tech support, I got to play with something other than our old family computer. And when someone's phone broke, I got to keep it. I ended up with my grandma's Motorola phone, a pixel that slipped out and then hit the pavement, and one phone that I just straight up found in the forest. <laughs> and then I never threw them out. And then when I left for university and flew across the ocean, I brought this pile of old cell phones with me. <laughs> Did I have a plan for that pile of phones? No. Am I a hoarder? Yes, but not if I come up with a project for them. I also chatted with lots of other developers and found that many of us are hoarding old tech, like phones and wires that are probably gathering dust in your closet right now. I want to show you how to repurpose those old phones and then give them a second life. We can walk out of here as upcyclers, not hoarders. So inspired by secondary smart devices like smartwatches and smart displays, I got started on taking my pile of phones and turning it into a secondary display where information is spread across multiple screens. It's called cell wall. This cell phone wall is a collection of my old phones plugged into a Raspberry Pi. It can display text, images, other visualizations. All these different phone screens are controlled by a Raspberry Pi, and each one can show different info. Well, let's go over to this table. My takeaway from Lucky's talk yesterday was that everyone should be doing live demos. <laughs> he was even kind enough to let me eat one of his bananas, so that's going to be my lucky charm. And if anything fails, we can blame the Hungarian bananas. <laughs> right, perfect. OK. Let's start with this. I'll be here to try and say hi. <laughs> and immediately, things aren't working quite how as I expected to. But it's OK. I can restart the program and make sure that things reconnect. There we go. Yeah. Things are showing up. Yeah. And now I can say hello to JSConf with this little board. So I also put this up on the wall. Oh, can we switch back to the slides? So I also put this up on the wall behind me in my home office. And I think even turned off, it's a much cooler Zoom background, you know, someone's virtual background. My fiance, she sits next to me at home, so she gets to have the same cool Zoom background. <laughs> this is her being so thrilled that she had to explain what it is yet another time. <laughs> so what works like this. We're going to break down this diagram and see how each of these components work individually, and then put them back together. So let's start with this pile of phones and the wall. 
we'll get started by building a shopping list of hardware needed. I live, in, I live in an apartment, so I wanted to make this removable from the wall. I used to use a foam board, but then I upgraded to this wood panel. I started off arranging all these phones on the floor, and then you fig figuring out about how much space is needed. Once I had some rough measurements, I went over to the hardware store, picked up some light plywood, and then got some sandpaper to sand down the edges. And depending on the look you're going for, you probably want to paint it, too. Finally, we need tools for mounting this panel onto the wall. And you can nail it in or buy command strips. Next, onto the phones. After gathering some old phones back from my closet, I started attaching them to the wood panel with Velcro. It's perfect for securely attaching those phones to the board and still allowing them to be removed if needed. For example, the battery on one of my phones started swelling just before I got here. So that was a great time to remove it before it became a fire hazard on the plane. This is already hard enough to explain to security. <laughs> Back at home, I have a Raspberry Pi to coordinate the phones, but really, you can use any computer for the server, and I'm going to be demoing here off, the lap off this laptop. All these phones need to get charged, so I used some regular USB cables that I had lying around to keep them plugged in. They're laid out with a bunch of little tiny wire clips, Eight, eight year olds will get you 100 of these clips in a bag, and then I've laid them out so each clip is only containing one or two wires. All these wires feed back into a USB hub, so I only need to want, plug one cable into a power outlet. I have here a USB hub that I got from a junkyard 15 years ago, but similar hubs can be found for about 20 euros. All in all, a total price of around 75 euros isn't too bad. And really, for a cool project like this that you build yourself, the bragging rights are worth so much more. <laughs> Plus, you probably do have some of these items already, I and mean, that knocks the cost down. So that's how you build the hardware. Now let's talk about getting these phones connected. Usually, phones and computers communicate to a server through the internet over Wi-Fi. But some of these phones don't have working Wi-Fi. These USB cables aren't just for show and aren't just for power. We can also use them to send data and commands. All the phones are hooked up to the USB hub, which is then connected to power and to the Raspberry Pi server. All these phones run Android. So I'm using a program from Google called the Android Debug Bridge to communicate with them. This program, called ADB for short, is normally used for developing Android apps. If you've tested your website on a live Android phone, you might have even used ADB before. But these tools for developing and debugging are also great for hacker projects. Each phone has a unique serial code that we can then use with ADB to target commands at it from the command line. You can run the command ADB devices to see a list of connected phones, similar to running ls to see a list of files in a folder. And then you can send commands to specific phones by specifying the serial code with this dash s flag. This even lets you open a full Unix shell on your phone. There are lots of commands, like install a new app, simulate a button press, and open a website on the phone. This gives you more power than what an app can do on its own, and even lets you send commands when your phone's screen is off. To use ADB, you need to allow USB, USB debugging on each phone. There's a link here with instructions for how to do that. And once you're done, you can control the phones from your computer. And this process is fairly straightforward. But there are thousands of different devices running Android out there. And some of these phones are 10 years old. So let's talk about some of the challenges that arise from being old, cheap, and or broken. I think the weirdest is that one of these phones just don't have a serial ID. That unique identifier we just talked about, that's a requirement to even use ADB. Turns out a couple models just don't have one. Luckily, ADB devices does have alternate flags for targeting a specific device. You can run ADB devices with the dash L, or long flag, which will return longer output and give you more details about your USB connection. Again, a little bit like LS dash L. The USB and transport ID columns here tell you about the USB port that the phone is plugged into. And then you can use those to target a phone with similar ADB flags. But it's also not very ideal, since your phone will stay, always stay the same, but you can plug into a different port on your computer. My long-term solution was to root the phone. 
Rooting is a process similar to jailbreaking an iPhone that gives you full access to a device, letting you run pseudo commands. With that, I was able to use an app to manually change the serial code into whatever value I wanted. Another challenge I ran into is that this phone doesn't have a working Wi-Fi chip anymore. And while we can send some data over USB, I do still want to be able to display websites, so I want to set up an HTTP connection. Turns out, you don't need a Wi-Fi chip because you can send HTTP requests using USB. ADB lets you set up port forwarding, so localhost port on your computer can be exposed to the phone over USB. Here, with requests that are made to the phone on localhost on port 3000, will be redirected to the server's localhost on port 3000 using this ADB reverse command. Finally, the most visible challenge is a lot of old phones have cracked screens that don't turn on. I have bad news, they're beyond saving, but they do become nice decoration to stick on the side. <laughs> but you know, if that phone does still turn on and it's just that the screen isn't working, you can actually still use it. You can duplicate your phone screen to your computer monitor using a tool called Screen Copy. Even if your phone's screen is broken, its rendering chip still works fine. This also lets you interact with the touchscreen using a mouse, and you can set the phone however you want to use it, like maybe as a music speaker. It's also a really nice tool for mobile web development. So if ADB set up, let's dig deeper into how the server works. <laughs> maybe the next content is just dry, so I need to get some claps with the water. All right, so ADB provides a great tool for controlling each phone without worrying about the phone being on, the Wi-Fi being connected, or your app even being open. It was also fairly slow. You need to input one command at a time, and these old phones take a few seconds to respond to ADB. So now we introduce scripting and turn to JavaScript and Node.js. We're going to use a library called Appium ADB. Internally, it uses Node to run the same ADB commands we just reviewed in a child process. We can write JavaScript to get a list of devices, just like on the command line. And now, we're able to represent all the connected phones using an array in Node.js. Let's start using Node to turn on the displays and show something. We can start with looping through the device's array to turn each phone on. And then we'll have some code to wait until we send a start command with ADB. This is another thing I'm going to try and demo, so let's go back to the desk here. Also, this is, a, this is a script that turns the phones on, so I should have them off first. I see that this works. There we go. There we go. This is running the same code I just showed on the slides. OK, so back to the slides. Now I start running into issues around communication speed. Talking over USB is pretty nice, but then ADB's command line, and then USB transfer, and then phone refresh dance takes a few seconds. So let's use the power of the web to speed up sending data from the server. We've already seen that we can create a TCP connection using ADB, and we can use that connection for HTTP requests and for WebSockets, WebSockets establish a persistent connection between the server and client for real-time apps like games or chat. And WebSockets work well for pushing small packets of data from the server to the clients. So after ADB is used to launch an app on each client, each client then establishes a WebSocket connection to the server. ADB still gets used for controlling power and as a backup system but now showing data is much faster and only limited by the cell phone's processing speed. And using WebSockets, the server sends each phone a URL, just like the start command. I pre-made some simple websites, like one to show text and one to show a clock. But really, you can take advantage of all the cool websites out there and display them. You can show weather, stocks, and music visualizers. So I want to show off a little bit of that back on the table. Let's see how this goes. Oh, 
I don't know. Well, the clock is working, but I'll show a video of some of the other content. Like this little, uh, oh, back of the slides. There's a little uh, website here that shows a 3D city that you can pan around, and there's all these different cool sites out there that really work super well for just displaying on these small phones. All right, going back. Uh, no, I'm already on the slides. I'm just looking at a video. Each of these cell phones are still tiny computers with a web browser. And even though these phones are around 10 years old, the web browser is still up to date. On this tablet, the newest version of Android you can get is Android 4.4 from 2013. And the newest web browser I could get was Firefox Nightly from last night. All right, so what about showing one thing across all of these phones, like splitting up lines of text or slices of an image? Each phone doesn't need to know that much. It just needs to know what, to, what it wants to show. The server will figure out what each phone should display and when. To do that, we need the server to figure out each phone's width and height and x and y position. Width and height is pretty easy. We can just read the screen size in JavaScript and then send that back to the server. X and Y is harder, since the server needs to figure out where these phones are relative to each, relative to each other in physical space. And you could use a computer vision ML library here to look at all the phones and then start determining rectangles and their position in space. But there's an easier way. <laughs> Human vision and a ruler. These screens are fixed in place, so the one-time manual setup is much faster. Then using that info, we can figure out how to display an image. The server figures out what size to stretch an image in order to cover every cell phone. And then, for each phone, it copies this image and then we'll crop it. Finally, it sends each of those phones one image slice. All right, let's try it out live. I brought this webcam here so I can take a picture of all of you and then upload it to cell wall, where we should see a split across the screens. Can I boot up the camera? All right. That's the wrong camera. <laughs> you don't need more of that. Okay. Three, two, one. Everyone smile. And I'll switch back to the program and try and upload this onto all the phones. And have that show on the desk here. All right, let's give this a shot. So if the server reads that and starts playing things up, and you can see some of the phones are getting image slices delivered to them, but some of them are not connected to the server anymore. OK, so we got one phone showing a slice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is the one I thought was going to fail. I couldn't get it to turn on this morning, but now it's the only one that's connected. <laughs> Thanks, Grandma. That phone's working really well. OK, I'm going to show the video anyways. So we should switch back to the slides. You can still see that it can split up an image around the whole thing. Uh, here you can see that ring starts to spread across all these different phones with some gaps in between. So displaying the data in order follows a similar process. Here's a function to display some text. Each line is split up into an array, and it's going to get distributed amongst the phone screens. I have a very rough sorting algorithm here to approximately sort lower x and y values first. This helps you display data that matches where you'd expect it to show up when you read left to right. And with this, sending all these, all these screens, we can send a message to the entire wall. I think we're just going to skip the demo for now. I'll just go straight to the video. But you can say hello in all these different ways. So we've now covered one half of this architecture diagram. Let's go into the other half. With a software setup, Salwa is able to display lots of different visuals. But you do still need to manually trigger it in Node. And wouldn't it be much cooler if it could respond to what's going on in your home? Well, we have a Node server. And one common way to communicate with a server remotely is to create a REST API. Let's start by creating a button to turn the phones on and off remotely. 
We'll set up a root, and then when this post request comes in, we can run the corresponding ADB commands. Then a simple web page can show on and off buttons, and then make a post request when this button is pressed. And really, all we've done is simply add a new input into the same communication path. Now, the server can be told when to send data to the clients in the wall. And we can use the same principle to integrate with other services. Something fires an HTTP post request to our server, and then we use that as a signal to do something on the cell phones. If that sounds familiar to you, I just described webhooks. This system is already used by lots of services like Stripe and GitHub so that you, they can push data to your servers. Webhooks are so well supported, they can, be ev they can even be used with smart home devices. Smart home software is actually a pretty similar flow to web servers. Something happens, like a television turning on or a user navigating to your site, and then the server does something in response, like dimming the lights or sending a push notification. Both smart home software and web servers can call webhooks by just making a regular post request to another server. There's a few different tools I use to there's a few different tools out there to coordinate smart home devices. I like to use Home Assistant, an open source project with many contributors, wide device support, and support for working on your local network without relying on an internet connection. And that last part is going to be pretty important when I try to demo this on conference Wi-Fi. So let's say that whenever someone plays a song on Spotify or on a speaker in my house, I want to show the song name on cell wall. In Home Assistant, we can watch for events when a speaker starts playing music. And then when that happens, you can configure it to call your webhook using a REST API command. So let's give that a shot. I'm going to restart the server and see if the phones reconnect. And go over to the table, please. I think I'm supposed to get cable in here for the speaker, but we'll just make do with the laptop speaker. All right. Oh no, it's not, not going. Okay, and this is where we come with the live, de live demo debug phase. Oh, I remember that after I launch the server, I need to reconnect the phones. I really, this is working. It's just my speaker isn't working. <laughs> it is listening to, this, to the music. <laughs> oh, okay, we can get this on the live stream. But as long as like that, you can display anything you want here. And once again, we've been able to use the power of the web to put together something pretty cool. Simply having a web server makes it possible to integrate your software with smart homes and with the internet of things. And hopefully, you have a better sense of how all these pieces fit together, and you can use some or all of them in your own projects. If you're curious to set up Home Assistant in your own home, there's instructions on the website to install it on a Raspberry Pi or Docker container. And I hope this talk has given you new ideas on giving your old phones a new life. If you're interested in learning more about Cellwall or any of my other projects, come check out my blog at tigeroaks.com. Let me know your ideas and projects on Twitter, and you can find me at not underscore woods. I also enjoy talking about PWAs, anything front-end or Android-related. I know I had so much fun building this talk project, and if you end up building one for yourself too, I'd love to see it. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>